this Thursday. Day after tomorrow. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll have some more technical stuff, and then at the end we'll have a 20 minutes of review for the final work. So. so Fracture mechanics really, well, really started in about 1921. Uh, there was a guy, Griffith. So he was an aeronautical engineer. And if you remember 1921, this is just a few years after World War One, And really, avia it was sort of the birth of aviation. And World War One was sort of the first time that planes were more than a novelty, you know, they were used for something. And of course then with that became the issues of how do we keep these things flying as they age. And the particular problem that exists to this day in terms of airplanes is fatigue drag and cracks occur. So how many of you think when you fly on an airplane there's no cracks in it? Hope they're not, but they're, there's cracks. There's definitely cracks. There are lots of cracks. And the idea is to understand how they're going to propagate well enough that you can predict them from you know, rupturing in a violent way. I remember a couple of years ago, just two or three years ago, there was a Southwest plane that had a rupture, right? And it sort of, uh, no, no one was hurt or anything, but it, it tore a part of the fuselage off and they had to make an emergency landing just two or three years ago. And it was had to associate with. Uh, fatigue cracks that were forming. So a lot of the work that's been done in fracture mechanics is motivated by the aircraft. You know, because you have to build them out of lightweight materials so that they fly, and then uh, these lightweight materials will uh, uh, you know, eventually, because things are thin and, and other things, uh, you eventually get cracks that form. And so we want to understand how they propagate to prevent anything catastrophic from occurring. And there was a guy, Griffith, who did a bunch of experiments where he'd take a sample with a crack in it. So he had a cracked sample and usually when we talk about infraction mechanics there's pretty much a convention that, and don't ask me why, but when the crack has two tips then its length is 2A versus if a crack has one tip, then then its length is A. Right? I don't know why that's the convention, but it is. So when you have a crack, say length 2A, and you apply a far field stress, so we'll call that you know, the stress of loading. And what he noticed was that for a range of different materials, that the point at which the, s the sample would rupture, meaning it would, you know, break into two pieces, crack completely through, was a constant value that was proportional to the stress of loading, you know, the far field applied stress, and the square root of the crack length, A. And so he did a bunch of experiments, and in fact, this 1921 paper, um, <laughs> you can download it, right? It's still it was presented to, uh, I think, the, uh, resort, or the uh, British Royal Society. And, uh, you, you know, I, I think I have a copy of it on my computer, likely, because uh, I've referenced it many times. So, <clears throat> so with that kind of idea in mind, l let's see if we can sort of do some, make some energy arguments about what may be occurring so that we can come up with Basically, we want, you know, if this is always a constant value, right, for, for a different material, then you might think that this is some material property, right? Just like we have material properties, Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, there might be some material property that's associated with fracture, okay? <clears throat> and so, I'm just sort of going to come up with a hypothetical thought experiment here, but if we have a sample, with our crack 2A, 
and we apply a far field stress, and you might imagine that, you know, from a static analysis that you have some weight, and so as you increase the weight, then this applies a stress that's higher and higher and higher. So it's really a force, but if you divide it by the width, then you have a stress, right? And so you have some, the sample itself, you have some elastic energy in it. So you might think of this like a spring. So from kind of a static analysis, you might think of that this is a spring connected to something connected to another spring connected to a load, right? You probably solve problems like this in statics. So this spring in the bulk of the material, well, this is energy associated with the elasticity of the material. Right? So I can, I can take a, a metal or, or even a piece of rock, right? Metal's more easy to think about because I can stretch it a little further, right, than it before it fails. But, but even a rock, I can take it and I can, I can pull on it a little bit, and it'll have some elastic response. And so there's some energy associated with that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to write down. <laughs> he looks like he's hung over. He's been been asleep. And <laughs> so. So if, you, if we you know, write down basically a, an energy balance, so the, the total energy in this mechanical system over here has some energy associated with the elasticity of the material, right? plus some energy associated with creating new surfaces of the crack. Right? So that's what this something in the middle is, is there's there's two surfaces there, and when we create new surfaces, we dissipate energy, and so this is an accounting for that energy. <clears throat> and then uh, the work done due to load, okay? And so you know the. Stated in words, like the conservation of energy says that, like the time rate of change of energy, or, or uh, the change in energy with respect to something, is equal to the energy created minus the energy stored, right? So thermo and stuff. Right? So, so here we're going to sort of make an argument that the total change in energy associated with a change in crack length is equal to zero due to this energy balance. So basically. Uh, we're going to take the derivative with respect to the change in crack length of both sides of this equation. And I paired those up because that's sort of the, the mechanical energy, the energy associated with the elasticity of the material so th this is the energy associated with creating new surfaces, and this is the energy associated with mechanically loading the material of the our system. And this thing is going to be equal to zero. And so the work due to loading. I mean, from physics 101, what is what is work? Force times distance, right? So exactly, it's force times distance, and distance is, you know, displaced distance. Right? So. We could also write that as force times the change in length, right? Or and force is, is nothing more than the stress, the four field stress times the area. <coughs> <coughs> 
And another way we could write change in length is to write the strain times the length. And that comes from the fact that our definition of strain, right, is strain in an engineering sense is the change in length time over the length, right? So delta L, delta L is equal to strain times the length, okay? Sorry. Going can't remember. There's a there's a trick where I don't have to do that. <laughs> can't remember. Um, so that's the work due to loading. Then we also have the so-called strain energy. So this is the mechanical energy stored in an elastic body, right? And what that is, is sort of the area under the stress-strain curve, right? So for an elastic material, stress-strain curve is this straight line with the slope E, right? So it's the area under this. So the elastic energy one half, this is, you know, I'm just doing an area calculation here, one half base time height, right, so at the load applied, that's the area under the curve. Um, then we also want to include the volume, right, so th this is actually an energy density. Uh, so it's really, uh, th this has units of work or energy per unit volume, so then if we multiply the volume, then we have something like that. <coughs> so, if we look at The work, the work per load, and the divided by the energy, and you have something like this. And that's equal to two. So another way to say this is that the work due to loading, external loading, is two times the strain energy. And so then our ener if we plug that relationship back in, then our energy balance simplifies to the energy associated with creating new surfaces plus this guy, or the energy associated with creating new surfaces must be equal to the change in strain energy with respect to length. So we're going to define our energy associated with creating new surfaces as two, because there are two sides to a crack, two surfaces on a crack face, right, a top and a bottom, times 2A, because that's the length of our crack, times some specific surface energy. So this is sort of something called specific surface energy times the width. So if we divide by the width so that we have the energy associated with creating new surfaces divided by width, then that's equal to 4A gamma. Uh, 
then the strain energy of a cracked elastic body divided by the width is equal to pi a squared times the far field stress times 1 minus mu squared over E. And this comes from a solution, Inglis, 1923. So there's a paper by this guy who was able to write that down. And this, this is for plain strain. Plain strain. So we haven't really talked about plane elasticity in this course, but we sometimes you can, under certain scenarios, you can simplify the full 3D elastic equations to 2D under certain scenarios, one of them being plane strain. So plane strain is actually the scenario which we derived equations for uh, stress on an earlier homework assignment. But this is the idea that the body is so thick in one direction. It's one direction is so thick that the strain is essentially zero in that direction, right? Because again, strain, so you can imagine like we're talking about strain in the z direction is delta L over L, but L is so large that this is approximately zero, right? Because L is so large compared to any amount of change in L. Right? Then this is called the plane strain problem. So typically plane strain or when you have things you approximate as two-dimensional that are really, really thick. A lot of times we do this in hydraulic fracture simulations. We take a plane of the earth, which is really thick in the vertical direction, right? And then we look at how fractures propagate in the 2D plane. That's not always a good assumption in hydraulic fracturing, but because the height, that essentially when you do that in hydraulic fracture, you're assuming that the height of the fracture is infinite, and it's not. So you sort of have to correct for that. Okay, so now we have basically um, the strain energy divided by width and the surface strain divided by width. We can multiply, you know, on both sides of the equation, we can multiply by width and then do our energy balance. So our energy balance You get this. So we typically call this guy something called G. G is known as the strain energy release rate. Okay. So in words, what this is, is the total amount of potential energy required to open up a new surface, okay, a new fracture surface. And if you were to go into the lab then and say do a set of experiments, take a large two-dimensional plate that's thick so that our plane strain assumption holds, we have a small crack in the middle of it. We apply a far field of stress, and we do this repeatedly. What you would see is that there would be some critical far field stress that if we did it enough times, 
statistically, there'd be some critical value that it occurred all the time. Right? And the, the, when I say occurred, it actually ruptured. It broke into two pieces. Right? Then this would be called the critical value of stress intent, the critical value of strain injury release rate. So and so that uh, critical value strain injury research, that's a material property. Um, I took a derivative. And so there was a two in front, but there was a four over here, right? So I, I took a derivative, so that left 4 gamma on this side and 2 pi A on this side, right? And then I divided the 2 out, and I got 2 gamma. Okay. So this thing is a, is, a, is a material property where, you know, if you go to the lab and you were to do these type of experiments and measure this repeatedly, uh, then you could define, at least in a statistical mean sense, some critical strain and release rate that would be a material property. This is a material's resistance to fracture, essentially. And then just one last sort of, if we look at just this part and we rearrange it um, such that we have This, so uh, so I just I just rearranged the equation. Right? Well, if you have ever had fracture, you, you wouldn't know this now. If you have had a fracture mechanics course, you would recognize this thing right here as the stress intensity factor, which is typically what we talk about. We don't we don't really uh, talk about strain energy release rate as a material property. We typically talk about st uh, stress intensity factor. And so this term is the stress intensity factor, and then that that you know from this then we have a relationship between the stress intensity factor and the and the strain injury release rate. So uh, you know if you measure one, there, there are different different experimental setups that can give you one from the uh, one or the other, but just know they're related. And so next time we'll talk more about the, the stress intensity factor. But the stress intensity factor is important. Because with the st with knowledge of the stress intensity factor, we can we we can determine what the stress field is anywhere near a fractured tip, right? So if we have a fracture, and we define that if this is the tip of a crack, and we define a coordinate system in terms of polar coordinates from the tip, so where this is r and this is theta, okay? and we're interested in the stress field out here in front of the fracture tip. Remember, at the tip of a crack, at the tip of a moving crack, it's basically a moving discontinuity and displacement. Right? You have a displacement jump there. And if you remember what the mathematical definition of strain is, mathematically, strain is a derivative and displacement. Strain is a derivative and displacement with respect to space. So at the tip of a crack, that's undefined. This derivative is undefined, okay? And then, of course, stress is some function of strain. In the simplest case, for elasticity, stress is like this. So stress is also a function of the derivative of displacement, which is undefined at the tip of a crack, right? So stress is, in fact, according to this theory, what this means is that it's actually infinite at the tip of a crack. But we know this is not physical. You know, no, no material can withstand actually infinite stress. So uh, there's sort of a hole in the theory of elasticity at the tip of a crack. And so me fracture mechanics was invented to sort of fill that hole. And, and the, way, the way it works or the way is that you solve asymptotic solutions, okay? And all of the information about the stress of the crack is contained in this 
critical in, in this stress intensity factor. And so what you can work out is that the stress, the full stress tensor, so the IJ components of the stress, are a function of the stress intensity factor over 2 pi r times some function, <coughs> some dimensionless function of theta. And so this, this over here is a dimensionless function. It, it doesn't contain any material properties or anything like that. So all of the information about the stress near a crack is contained in the stress intensity factor. That's why it's sort of an important thing when it comes to fracture mechanics. And so, you know, what, what the model sort of predicts is that, you know, as you go, well, I mean, uh, you can see just from this, the stress as a function of r, square root of r, right? So as, as r moves away from the crack tip, and if this is stress as a function of r, as you move away from the crack tip, since it's a square root, you're going to have this decay behavior. But at the crack tip itself, it's undefined. So the crack tip would be zero, R zero. Okay. So a little bit, you know, next time we'll talk about then, you know, a little bit more about stress intensity factors and how that we can use them uh, to sort of predict, predict fracture trajectories in hydraulic fracturing events.